nature. The more we learn about it, the more we realize how important it is. Coral reefs cover less than 1% of the ocean floor, but are home to a quarter of all marine life. And life in the oceans provides more oxygen than even the rainforests. Environments like this are precious, something it's taken years of study to fully appreciate. Back in time, we saw nature quite differently. Have you ever dreamed of living an idyllic existence under the waving coconut palms of a remote South Sea island? Of course you have. To loaf and sleep and fish and swim lazily, peacefully, and happily on the bounty of a glorious tropical nature. Yes, life is simple and beautiful on Bikini Atoll until today when there enters into Bikini Lagoon a fantastic, the incredible thing called the atomic bomb. In 1946, a nuclear bomb was detonated on the Pacific island of Bikini Atoll. Over the next 12 years, 22 more nuclear tests like this were carried out. One, named Castle Bravo, was a thousand times more powerful than Hiroshima. Three islands and their coral reefs were obliterated. Nature was not the priority. Today, we see things differently. An awakening has begun. We're at a turning point in history and moving in a new direction. How we live with nature now will determine our future. A new age is upon us. The age of nature. Fifty years after the last nuclear test at Bikini Atoll, a scientific team traveled to this remote location in the Pacific Ocean to see if anything had survived. I was invited on an international expedition to Bikini Atoll as the coral expert. We were in fact the first team of scientists to conduct our marine surveys on the reefs. Heading out for the first dive, I was really full of anticipation. I didn't know what to expect. Over the 12 years of nuclear testing, the marine life and the islands at Bikini Atoll were just systematically decimated. It was just total annihilation. Having heard about the extent of the nuclear devastation, I thought maybe I would be confronted with a moonscape. But as I cut through the water, descending down to about 20 metres deep, I couldn't believe it. I was absolutely shocked at what I was seeing. There were corals, there were fish, there were anemones. There was everything you would expect to see on a normal, healthy reef ecosystem. If you didn't know about the history, you would think that nothing had ever happened at this location. Even the wrecks of ships deliberately sunk in the blast were covered in coral. phenomenal to think that in just 50 years, coral cover can come back to close to as good as you're going to get on any reef around the world.
to think that even the crater itself can be recolonized by corals and other marine life. It just shows you the potential that nature has for recovery if it's left alone. Across much of our planet, nature is under pressure. Yet it's essential for our modern way of life. One of the first places we discovered this was here in Panama. For most of human history, we lived among nature. With great awareness of the plants and animals we depended on. Something that the Imbera Wunan still maintain. The forest is their home, but it is also important for the wider world because of one essential thing, water. El agua es un es un recurso de mucho valor. Es más valioso que hasta el el dinero. ¿Quién puede hacer el agua? Es la vida, es nuestra vida. The Ambera here live alongside the Chagres River, the principal source of water for the world's greatest trade corridor, the Panama Canal. This 50-mile channel allows cargo ships to take a shortcut between two oceans in just 10 hours avoiding a month-long journey around South America. A million containers a week are carried along the canal, accelerating the flow of goods across the world. The building of the Panama Canal was the dream of humanity, of mankind. It just united the world. Opened in 1914, after 30 years of construction, this was an incredible feat of engineering. Still in operation today. Each vessel is raised up into the canal and down the other side through a series of colossal locks. Every ship that goes through the Panama Canal requires about 50 million gallons of fresh water from the Chagas, every ship. And there are 40 ships a day, so you multiply that and it's an astronomical quantity of fresh water. It's the energy, the water of the Chagas that makes possible the Panama Canal. Without this river, there would be no Panama Canal. Back in the 70s, the government of the time wanted the land to be more productive. So they encouraged people to create pastures. The forest began to disappear. I started studying anthropology, and I was asked to study the peasants of the Panama Canal watershed. So in 1979, I went to the canal watershed, and that to me was a revelation. I had no idea of how serious this situation was. The rate of conversion of forest to pasture land was astronomical. That's what it looked like. The smoke that you can see in the background, there were settlers moving in. You cut here, you burn, 
and then the fire goes out of control and there's nobody to stop it. What used to be forest, now it's like a desert. When the rains came, the bare soil began to wash away, filling the rivers and lakes with sediment, reducing the amount of water for the canal. I came to realize there's going to be such an accelerated rate of soil erosion and silting of the lakes, there'll be no canal. Then, in 1983, severe drought struck, threatening the canal. Its closure would mean economic ruin. The issue went all the way to the president. His response was, Dr. Hackerton, this is a national security issue, and we have to stop it. The conversion of forest to pasture was thought to be the root of the problem. So Dr. Hecadon's team began studying the ecosystem more closely. Gradually dawned on me how important a role in the cycle of water trees have. In the forest where you have lots of foliage and dried out leaves and trunks and branches, the soil is softer, and so the water permeates, and the dry season comes, and all of that water stored in the soil begins to be pumped into the creeks, and there's water. The forest soaks up the rainwater and steadily releases it in what's known as the sponge effect. This keeps rivers flowing through the seasons. It's a fundamental natural process that the Panama Canal depends on. To protect the water supply, they had to protect the forest. If our proposal would not have been taken then, there would have been no Panama Canal today as we know it. A national park was created, safeguarding 320,000 acres of watershed forest. The benefits of these forests are now officially recognized, and their value goes far beyond economics. If you do away with your forest, it's not only a matter of the diversity of plants and creatures, it's life itself. Twenty-five percent of Panama is now National Park. When you look back, you get this satisfaction. My goodness, where are we now? Look how far we come. Human development and nature have to go hand in hand. I think each country comes to a point it has to make decisions. What is the best? Not in the short term, but what is the best in the long term for the most people? By protecting the forest of the Chagres, Panama has prospered and the Embera are able to continue their way of life. Hemos convivido siempre con la naturaleza por cientos y cientos de años. La tierra nos puede ayudar a nosotros de poder vivir 
y también nosotros poder ayudar a la tierra para que ella siga produciendo. Hay que preservar la naturaleza. The Panama Canal remains one of the greatest feats of human engineering. And discovering the role that nature played was an awakening. All of this is essential to all of this. Bhutan, high in the Himalayas, one of the last Buddhist kingdoms, a country rich in ancient culture, but also very forward thinking. Bhutan is carbon negative. It's the only country in the world that absorbs more carbon than it produces. Achieved by looking after nature. Despite this, Bhutan is now vulnerable to climate change, which is impacting our planet faster than ever before. This is a global problem that needs a global solution. We're at a turning point in history and moving in a new direction. How we live with nature now will determine our future. A new age is upon us. The age of nature. So the fact that we are carbon negative today perhaps may be an example to the rest of the world. But uh, it's also very important uh, in a sense that we have to realize and acknowledge that the, uh, this is the result of decades uh, of implementation of enlightened but courageous policies. By law, we are required to maintain a minimum of 60% forest coverage. But in reality, there's 70%, a little more than 70% of our country is under forest cover. Uh, why are forests important? Well, for many reasons. And uh, I can tell you two very important reasons. The first everybody knows of, it's because uh, it helps to fight against climate change. This forests are a vast reserve of carbon. It's a carbon sink. The second reason is that our forests are largely pristine. They are natural, they've been undisturbed. So our forests today are a safe haven for a very rich biodiversity. Trees, plants, fungi. This is why it's very important that we protect the forest as they are. Our country rises from about 100 meters above sea level all the way up to about 7,500 meters above sea level. Bhutan is nothing but mountains and valleys. Seventy percent of the population live along the banks of rivers. It's the only farmable land. We've always had a very strong association with water. In terms of agriculture, obviously, it's very important. As you can see, the paddy fields around here, they've required water. And for centuries, we've been cultivating 
uh, race in these valleys. The Bhutanese also harness the power of their rivers to generate renewable energy. It contributes to the country's carbon negative status. But people here still face an uncertain future. They are on the front line of the climate crisis. As a politician, Sering Tobge is concerned for the future of his country. He's monitoring the growing threat, which can only be seen high up in the mountains. The entire Himalayan region is the world's third largest repository of ice after the North and South Poles. So this is why some scientists have called this region the Third Pole. Global warming and climate change is affecting the glaciers in the Himalayas, uh, just like they're affecting glaciers all over the world. Over two thirds of these glaciers are expected to melt by the turn of the century and the glacial lakes holding the meltwater are growing. Currently held back by natural dams, it's only a matter of time before the dams will give. And the flooding will be disastrous. In 2010, a team of farmers and villagers were recruited to lower the water levels of a lake that was near bursting point. This involved moving each rock by hand to slowly release the water. Working at altitude with little oxygen and in freezing conditions, it took five years in total to lower it by 15 feet. This has bought some time, but it hasn't solved the problem. The glaciers are continuing to melt and Bhutan isn't the only country that's vulnerable. Eight others would also be directly affected by the melting of the Himalayan ice cap, impacting up to 1.6 billion people. Well, uh, on the one hand, I know that uh, humanity will persevere. We will prevail. And now protecting the glaciers uh, can't be done by a single country. Uh, the entire world must come together to control global warming. No one country can uh, address climate change adequately to reverse its effects or to prevent its future effects. So we must come together uh, as, as a world. So if a small country can do that, uh, my submission is uh, larger, more powerful, more rich uh, countries uh, with a lot more knowledge and experience. They can obviously do a lot more and they must. Bhutan cannot fight climate change alone. It is a global problem that needs global solutions. Ultimately, if we're going to understand how to stop climate change, we need to understand our planet. And so that's what we do. We try to categorize the forests and the soils around the world so we can understand how much carbon is in them and how much carbon they could absorb. Tom Crowther and his team collect information from scientists working in different forest environments. They combine this with satellite data to generate world maps that show where forests are and their capacity for storing carbon. It's 
So every year we emit greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. And one of the main ones is carbon dioxide. Each year we emit about 10 gigatons of carbon into the atmosphere. That's like 27,000 Empire State Buildings. And over time, some of that gets absorbed by the oceans or on land. But since the start of the Industrial Revolution, we've increased that number in the atmosphere by about 300 gigatons. So that's completely changed our planet and our climate across the globe. This is a NASA simulation of the carbon cycle changing throughout the year. And what's cool is you can see the high concentrations of carbon in, indicated by the red colors in the high latitudes. But as we tick on into spring and then summer, we see these concentrations fade. And that's caused by one thing. It's just the emergence of leaves on trees. This transforms the carbon cycle each year. Just look at the power of trees. Just imagine what was possible if we had more. The scale of global forest cover has only recently become clear. So we use a really brand new approach. Our models are made from people on the ground all over the world, actually counting trees and saying how big they are. And by sending us in all of that information, we use machine learning and artificial intelligence to then build the maps from the bottom up. So it's really so much stronger that we can build them from real on the ground information. So this map actually shows where the existing trees are around the planet. But by characterizing which ecosystems store trees, we can also say how many trees there could be, and that's indicated by the yellow colors. So yeah, before the expansion of human civilization, there was almost twice as many trees on the planet as there are today. There's about 5.8 trillion trees across the planet. Now obviously we've depleted that by about almost three trillion. So there's huge areas that are available for restoration. Obviously, we can't use the areas that we're using for agriculture or urbanization, but there's still almost a billion hectares of forest area around those spaces that we could actually use right now. It's degraded ecosystems that aren't being developed. So if we were to make the most of those regions, we could go a long way in the fight against climate change. We've known for a long time that trees draw down carbon from the atmosphere. But it's only now that we can really see their potential. So the key is that we restore these ecosystems in the right ecologically minded way. That means we don't plant trees in ecosystems that would naturally be grasslands. And we also restore trees in a very biodiverse mixture. We don't just want plantations, monocultures of the same species. You need all the different interacting species which help one another to grow and capture huge amounts of carbon. There are no downsides. As long as we restore in the right ecosystems that would naturally reforest and we restore good, healthy biodiversity, then we get strong carbon capture and all the other thousands of ecosystem services that forests provide. We absolutely need nature to survive on this planet. If humanity is going to have a chance, we're going to need to restore ecosystems all across the globe. So there are people restoring ecosystems already. All over the world, there's thousands of projects. But this has to increase, both in the scale of those projects and in the number of projects. So the really fascinating thing is, the areas that are most important for carbon storage are also the most important for biodiversity. And biodiversity isn't just a magical thing, it's the life support system for our planet. 